Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I need to go over all the CE information, so if you wish to earn ASHA CEUs for this course, you must attend the one-hour session. The handouts and all the forms you need to complete to get credit are posted on speechandlanguage.com. Be sure and mail the forms to the address posted on speechandlanguage.com, and it also appears at the end of this slide deck. The forms need to be postmarked by Friday, August 28th. If more than one person is at your location listening to this webinar, please download the attendance sheet and make sure that each person requesting CEU signs the sheet and completes the ASHA participant form and the evaluation form. ASHA requires us to remind you that you cannot decide to earn ASHA CEUs for this course after Friday, August 28th. Um, if you are online for less than 60 minutes, or if you do not turn in the ASHA participant form postmarked by August 28th, you will not have the opportunity to earn ASHA CEUs at a later date. Only those participants who follow the instructions and meet ASHA requirements for earning CEUs will have that course information submitted to the ASHA CE registry. There are no CEUs offered for the recording of this session available on the website. It's my pleasure, after all that CE information, to introduce Nancy Lewis, a co-author of the KLPA3, who will be presenting today. Nancy? Hi. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy Castilleja and Sherry from Pearson. And welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you all are here. Here's the um, presenter disclosure information, and at just a reminder, at the very end of the presentation, there will be a slide that captures the CE information that Nancy Custia had just reviewed. So we're here today to talk all about the Con Lewis Phonological Analysis 3rd Edition, um, which we're really excited that so many of you have joined us. We'll go, this will really be an overview of the um, KLPA3. So we'll be talking about some of the behind the scenes story, um, why we like to update um, assessment tools, what's the same um, in terms of the KLPA and what's new. We'll go over some of the administration scoring and analysis, talk a little bit about print and digital choices, um, talk a little bit about interpretation and treatment planning, um, and really review how this tool is a clinician-to-clinician -clinician assessment tool. So Linda Kahn and I have been practicing clinicians for decades and really um, developed this from the start with clinicians in mind. And finally, we'll talk about some of the psychometric characteristics and technical information that help, um, that, that have ensure that this is a reliable and valid measure. Um, if you have questions along the way, you can use the chat box to your left, and um, Nancy Castilleja will be monitoring that and will be um, either responding or saving questions for the end of our presentation. So um, the behind the scenes, just a kind of very brief background, it was in the early 80s, 1980s, that um, Linda Kahn and I began to develop a phonological analysis as a companion tool to a traditional articulation test. And we, after some um, research and field testing, we selected the goldman Fristo test of articulation. So at that point in time, um, the early 80s, which sounds like a really long time ago, I was thinking about this last night, you know, it was pre pre-internet, pre-home computers, pre-cell phones, um, so a really different world. Um, we, there were kind of some rigid distinctions in our field between articulation and phonology. And then evidence began to surface as, as people began to publish research about the positive outcomes of using a phonological approach in therapy, with, especially with children with multiple speech sound errors or, you know, with highly unintelligible speech. Those, you know, as clinicians, we know that um, working with kids with um, a lot of speech sound errors can take a really long time, but we began to see some evidence that that time in treatment could be really um, reduced with intelligibility increasing more rapidly with a phonological approach. 
So as clinicians ourselves, we really understood the value of expanding the results of a traditional articulation matrix to include a phonological process profile. And so rather than thinking about articulation versus phonology, by partnering with the Goldman Fristo, the GFTA and KLPA really act in tandem to provide a comprehensive evaluation of a child's speech sound production, and that's really a result of very strong collaboration among all of the authors and the Pearson team. And um, I'm happy to say that the current terminology in the field um, is no longer articulation is over here and phonology is over there, but everything is under the umbrella term of speech sound disorders. So um, before we get into the details, I'd like to have a, we have a little poll here to see what your experience is with using a phonological analysis for speech sound assessment. So you can vote, either very experienced, have some experience, have little experience, or have no experience. It's all anonymous, <laughs> so feel free to um, go ahead and vote, and then we'll play the results. It's a really nifty part of um, webinars these days. Slowly rounding up to all of our participants. So I'm just going to um, a couple more seconds to vote, cast your poll, and um, results, and we'll show a graph. So it looks like a good, you know, about a third of you feel um, have a, quite a bit of experience. The majority, a little over half, have um, some experience, and then about 15% have. Um, a little experience, and nobody um, has no experience, which is really great. It's a great, um, great statement about where our field is these days. That um, because it, the poll would probably look differently each decade um, from the 80s to the current moment. So I'm glad that people have some experience. Um, those of you that have a little experience, don't be dissuaded by some of the terminology. It's Stuff you know, but maybe um, don't use those words every day. But once you kind of get the framework in your mind again, then it'll all come back to you. <laughs> so why do we like to update assessment tools? Um, the KLPA third edition reflects the changes that were made for the Goldman Fristo um, third edition. We have an updated item set and, and current normative data. So the updated analysis for the KLPA allowed us to identify um, categories of phonological processes that I'll talk about in more detail um, that we're calling core phonological processes and supplemental phonological processes. And um, it also allowed us to incorporate changes based on what we now know as best practice as well as clinician feedback over the years. And it's allowed us to introduce a digital edition of the analysis. So what has stayed the same? You know, when you are updating an assessment tool that's been useful for clinicians for a number of years, the first edition of the Con Lewis was um, published in 1986. Actually, the first edition of the Goldman Fristo was published in 1999. So these are assessment tools that have been around for a long time, and um, especially in terms of the Goldman Fristo, it's really set an early mark as a gold standard in a as a test of articulation. So what has stayed the same with the third edition is that we've um, we are still a companion tool to the Goldman Fristo, and we the KLPA allows clinicians to complete a phonological process analysis based on the single word production elicited via the GFTA. 
The results will give you a comprehensive speech sound production profile that is achievable within most clinical or school settings. And we really have worked diligently to um, keep this as an assessment tool that's really accessible given caseload demands and setting demands. We, in the second edition, we included a sound change map, um, which we have in this edition as well, and I'll speak more about that in a little bit. And also a phonetic inventory for both actually consonant for a consonant phonetic inventory. Our norms um, are for individuals from two years to 21 years, 11 months, and the normative data set is derived from the U.S. standardization sample based on the current census data, census figures. So. Um, you know, you never want to throw the baby out with the bathwater in terms of keeping what's good, and we feel like these features have been useful for clinicians. So, as I mentioned, the Goldman, the Con Lewis phonological analysis works in tandem with the Goldman Fristo test of articulation. So, as the Goldman Fristo is administered and the clinician records the child or individual's responses to those. Um, stimulus words, after you've completed the Goldman Fristo analysis, you can proceed with that same data to, to complete a phonological analysis with the KLPA. So we've talked about what stayed the same. Let's talk, to, talk about what, some of what's new. Um, the current third edition of the Goldman Fristo has 60 stimulus words in the sounds and words subtest. And those 60 words were selected from over 126 target words that were actually field tested. And the final 60 were chosen through a very collaborative process that included Ron Goldman, Macklin Fristo, Linda Kahn, myself, and the Pearson test development team. So there was nothing random at all about this, um, the selection of these stimulus words. There was great deal of thought from many different angles that went into that. <clears throat> the stimulus words include monosyllabic, bisyllabic, and multisyllabic target words. And there was, there was also a diligent effort to limit cultural bias as much as possible. Um, you probably know that it's not possible to completely eliminate cultural bias in testing. Um, however, we did keep that in mind. So, is, um, we have certain words that, that are familiar to the Goldman Fristo from the first edition, house and duck. Um, and a, some, here's some examples of some new words, guitar and vegetable. Um, so 60 words, some of which are um, similar words from previous editions and some of which are new words. I mentioned in the um, overview slide that through the data, we actually have identified and categorized um, the phonological processes into three large groups. One is the core phonological processes, and these are basically the, one, the processes that were most frequently occurring and are considered to be developmental in nature. So what does that mean, really? Well, it means um, if you are a two-year-old learning speech, learning, um, developing your, acquiring your language, and um, the process of speech development, speech sound development, many of these processes occur um, naturally. So a, an 18-month-old usually doesn't say juice, but they might say do or deuce for juice. And so that kind of a sound error is what we consider developmental in nature. Another good example is deleting final consonants. You know, very, very young children, you know, under the age of two might leave off final sounds initially, but shortly thereafter they are including final sounds in their speech production. So um, these 12 processes, um, I'm going to use our little pointer here, um, deaffrication, gliding of liquid, stopping, stridency deletion, vocalization of liquids, palatal fronting, velar fronting, cluster simplification, deletion of final consonant, 
syllable reduction, final devoicing, and initial voicing are the 12 processes that we have identified in the core phonological process category. So what makes these core processes special? Well, through the normative data, you are able to derive standard scores based on the performance of the individuals in the, based on the performance of the individuals in the standardization sample. So on these core phonological processes, you can derive standard scores, percentile ranks, age equivalents, um, competence intervals, and as well as scores for females and males. Um, we have a, although up here it says a core phonological process analysis, we have some, an item analysis, which I'll talk about briefly in a little bit, as well as some qualitative data, so the percent of occurrence of each process, and a new metric called process per word. So here is a snapshot of the core phonological processes in the, um, the KLPA-3 and a close-up of the processes. So you can see here that <clears throat> we've also categorized the process, grouped the processes into um, the type of error that they are. So um, manner errors, place errors, um, reduction errors, and voicing errors. And you can see that we have the target words spelled orthographically. We have the IPA transcription uh, cell for the individual transcribed response, and then the target sounds and the sound changes that the individual makes. And then you can go across and actually um, mark the cell that corresponds to the phonological processes that may be involved in those sound changes. So the next set of 12 processes are supplemental phonological processes. And these also have were data derived um, through the standardization sample. And these processes represent um, those kinds of sound changes that are a bit more clinical in nature. So they're not necessarily um, observed in typical development. Some of them may be, but some of them um, not so much. Like we know, for example, backing to dealers, um, deleting initial consonants and glottal replacement are not types of sound errors that occur in typical speech development. Um, so these are, um, you can kind of think of them as being a little bit more clinical in nature. Um, and these processes, press this forward, um, here's a, an example of um, back up a couple seconds. Russian wasn't operating with me. Um, these processes are listed here, and there are 12 of them as well. And what you can do is analyze the same, you know, of course, the same um, production of the individual and record the supplemental phonological processes that were used by the child or individual. And the summary, the, the sum of all this, you can convert to a percent of occurrence per phonological process. So we'll um, have some examples of that a little bit later. Also, um, because these are less frequent in typical development, these may be clinical signs that could inform you diagnostically or prognostically and could really in some ways be considered red flags for further consideration. As well, these supplemental phonological processes contribute to the um, metric, the processes used per, per word metric. So here's an example of the, um, the supplemental process, supplemental phonological processes, and in the record form, 
trying to get our little pointer to cooperate here. Um, so you can see they're again grouped by manner, place, reduction, and voicing. And here's a close-up of the supplemental processes. So it's good to note that these processes do not get scored for standard scores, but they will provide you um, considerable information, qualitative data in terms, and that can be really useful for uh, treatment planning. <laughs> so what happens if we, if there's, a, uh, if, a, if an individual uses processes that are not in the core group and not in the supplemental group, um, which those of you that have worked with kids um, or individuals, um, usually we say children because a lot of times that's the caseload that we have um, when we're working in a phonological way. But, um, you know, sometimes children, individuals with speech sound disorders can have really idiosyncratic type of error pattern. So we, through the KLPA3 sound change booklet, just like the sound change booklet in the second edition, we provide you with every possible phonological process involved in any possible sound change that an individual makes on the GFTA3 stimulus words. And these, what we're calling other phonological processes, may be recorded on the KLPA analysis form and may contribute to the process per word metric as well. So the sound change booklet is just that. It's a um, a booklet, a standalone booklet, and I know that you probably won't be able to see this clearly, um, the top figure very clearly, but those of you that have used this with the second edition, this will be kind of a familiar format to you. Um, and here's a close-up of the page. So you can see that item one, house, have listed the target sounds, including the vowels, and then um, along the top are um, all the different possible sounds that could have been used instead of the H. So, for example, if a child said douse instead of house, and the sound changed, the, the target H went to a D, then you see that the processes of stopping, initial voicing, and alveolarization were used in that one sound change. And the bold processes in the sound change booklet are the core phonological processes, and the processes listed that are not bold <clears throat> are not part of the 12 processes that are scored for um, standard scores. So it's a really useful tool, it's, um, it, especially for those, for those clients that may have really um, complicated speech sound patterns. And it's also, I have found over the years, really kind of tutorial. So the more you use this, the more you begin to understand a few things. One, that um, one speech sound, one uh, speech change, such as an H becoming a D, could really involve multiple processes. Um, so, um, a bit distinct from a traditional articulation matrix where you look at, you know, what you kind of note, whether correct or incorrect production. Um, this is a deeper analysis and you may not be finished with the analysis when you just identify one process that's been used. So progressing on, um, the KLPA3 has a consonant analysis summary page. So on that summary page, which I'll show you in a couple of slides, we have a um, phonetic inventory for consonant sounds in word initial, word medial, and word final position, um, a place to note consonant clusters, uh, phonological process item analysis, and then a place to really note the individual, um, the identification of core supplemental and other phonological processes used frequently by the individual, as well as a process per word um, population metric. <clears throat> and this summary page really will be a very strong and useful treatment planning tool for you as you um, continue to work with the individual. So here's a 
snapshot of the um, consonant ana analysis back, or actually it's not the back page, consonant analysis page of the record of the analysis form. Um, like I mentioned, these are some of what's included in that analysis page. Here's an example of the consonant um, phonetic inventory. So some of you may be familiar with this and some of you may not be, but it also is an extremely useful um, treatment tool. So what we have suggested is that um, you really use this as an inventory of the child's speech sound uh, repertoire. So an inventory would include both sounds that are produced correctly as the target sounds and sounds that are produced in place of target sounds. So in my original example of the of house becoming douse, we would give the child credit for an initial D, but we would note that with a little tally mark. <clears throat> and we would give the child credit for a word final S, and we would circle that S to let us know at a glance that the child has a D in word initial position, although it was used in, sub in change for the target sound, and the child produced the final fricative of S accurately. And we also have a place here for the consonant clusters, whether they are produced accurately as the target or um, some other production. But say a child said um, blue for blue, we would note a BW consonant cluster. And the ways that this phonetic inventory can be useful in treatment um, are that you know, one, one approach in therapy is to start with what the child has going for them already. And so you could really use this phonetic inventory as a basis to derive some of your um, treatment words. This um, diagram is a um, really an item analysis that you'll probably want to study a little bit more thoroughly um, once you start using the KLPA3, but it's we looked at the standardization data, the normative data, and looked at when the majority of individuals no longer used these processes. So I think we used 85%, um, so um, you know, the majority of the of two-year-olds um, no longer used uh, final devoicing and initial voicing in females and gaffrication, final devoicing and initial voicing in males. If we look um, at a little more interesting age group um, or if we look at age, kind of look backwards from age 311 back, then we see that all of these processes that are listed here are no longer used very much at all. Um, by young children. So that gives you a bit of the feeling of um, the developmental nature of some of our core phonological processes. So then we have a summary box for um, note what you have found and what you view important in terms of the phonetic inventory, the core processes, supplemental processes other phonological processes and processes per word. Um, the processes per word is a, a new metric um, for the KLPA and we have included it because we feel like it will become a metric that's very sensitive to treatment um, and may reveal progress and changes through therapy that the standard scores might take a little bit longer to reveal. So. Again, back to that initial example of house becoming douse, there were three processes involved in that one sound change. Um, and so what we're allowing clinicians to do is actually um, add up all the processes used in one word and then take an average over the 60. And that average will serve as a, uh, as a metric that will um, vary aligned with a uh, um, severity metric. 
So one new component to the KLPA3 is the um, is a bowel analysis, which we're really excited about. You know, the field has um, progressed in terms of our understanding of bowels and import the importance of bowel production. So we have included a bowel analysis page. Um, we look at eight phonological processes that impact bowel production. Have um, a bowel phonetic inventory also, and um, a place to summarize bowel production. So um, we provide some the definition. Sorry, my little cursor is going a little. Um, definitions in terms of the eight bowel phonological processes that we have identified through the literature as being the most um, the most talked about um, in the literature, <coughs> and then we have a a, um, a bowel phonetic inventory and a place to note the individual's bowel usage. So. Um, and a place to summarize vowel productions and alterations and vowel, the vowel phonological processes used. So really through the consonant analysis and the vowel analysis and the um, standard scores and percent of occurrence for the core phonological processes as well as the supplemental processes, we're really hopeful that the KLPA3 will provide you with a very comprehensive profile of your client's um, speech sound production capabilities and um, areas of difficulty, as well as um, provide you with information about um, the influence of dialect, um, a place to really get a handle on their overall intelligibility, and not just to rate their overall intelligibility, but through all of this quantitative and qualitative information data, you'll really have more of a handle on what's contributing to that um, eligibility and what the best way to go about improving the child's intelligibility is. So um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we're really excited, along with the Goldman Fristo, um, from Bristow third edition and the KLPA third edition to have some choices for clinicians. So we'll have digital um, versions through Q Interactive and Q Global and um, also paper and pencil versions. Um, so there's lots of uh, options out there. And rather than spend a lot of time on this right now, um, we'll be doing more webinars in the future very specific to the um, digital options. So um, here's another poll for you. What form of administration and scoring do you currently prefer? Paper and pencil, digital, or are you unsure? And the unsure might be that you're kind of interested in digital, but you haven't ever, you haven't used it yet. So um, paper and pencil would be you know, that's your comfort zone, which um, is where we've all come from. And maybe some of you have had a lot of opportunities to actually use digital um, assessment tools in one way or another <clears throat> already. So give this poll a little bit more time. And again, it is anonymous, so no harm in um, funding. Okay, well, let's take a look at these results. So, um, really isn't too surprising given where we are in the field. Um, you know, about 40% are preferring um, paper and pencil. Uh, you know, an equal amount is kind of unsure, which to me says that there's some interest in digital, but haven't really um, seen how it will actually really work in their practice. Um, and, and almost a quarter of you actually um, already prefer digital. So it does appear to be the wave of the future, as with everything these days with apps 
um, doing so much more for us, and um, you know, we'd be we'd be um, negligent if we weren't um, working on ways to make our work easier and more streamless. And digital holds that promise. Um, so it's certainly worth investigating. And um, Pearson has um, can go to the Pearson website for some more information on um, digital. And we'll also be Pearson will be promoting and producing some webinars that are specific to actually how these platforms work, both Q Interactive and Q Global. So it's definitely stay tuned for those. And some of you may have already used the self digital or the um, expressive vocabulary test in a digital version, so you may have some experience with that. Um, so why don't we move on to interpretation and treatment planning, which really is always the, you know, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is what, as clinicians, we're all really interested in. Um, because the KLPA3 is new and um, will be um, out, you know, in, in the later um, this fall, late late September, um, I wanted to really take this opportunity to walk you through some of the components that have um, that we've kept from the second edition and some new components, but. And, and because this is an hour presentation, the focus of this is not on interpretation and treatment planning. However, that really is why we do what, why we do assessments, um, really to interpret them and to design treatment plans so that we can um, improve the quality of life and quality of communication of the individuals that we work with. So we're really happy and kind of proud that the KLPA3 provides you with both quantitative data and qualitative data, because both of those play a, a major part in treatment plans. The quantitative data um, allow you to compare a client's performance to others of that same gender and same age. And because Pearson does such a really terrific job in terms of psychometrics, know that the reliability and validity provide evidence that this test actually is a reliable measure, a reliable instrument, and it measures the intended construct. So like I've mentioned, the, tw the 12 core phonological processes will allow you to derive these quantitative scores. And we all know how, um, how essential standard standardized scores are, in, especially in terms of um, public school systems and the requirements, um, be they um, fair or not so fair requirements in terms of determining eligibility for a child, um, having a reliable and valid instrument is really essential. However, standard scores don't always tell the whole story, and they also don't always um, help you um, understand all that you need to understand in terms of planning for treatment. So the qualitative scores, the percent of occurrence that, a, that an individual uses a particular phonological process, this process per word metric, as well as the phonetic inventory for consonants and vowels really will help you flush out um, the treatment planning um, for any individual. And we, you know, I, I really on purpose picked some pictures here that, that show that, um, and though I've been saying children, it's not just young children that present with speech sound disorders. Um, it, you know, our norms go up to 20, um, 2111, so almost 22 years old, and um, it, this can be a useful analysis for individuals of um, a wide age span. So <clears throat> when you think about interpreting your results and treatment planning, um, there's through the 
years there's been a lot of um, discussion, I was going to say debate, I'll say discussion in the literature and at ASHA conventions in terms of what kind of a, a quote approach to you. So very generally, speaking very generally, an articulation approach to intervention is one that targets each sound error. It looks at the child's sound errors are assumed to be motor-based so that practice and motoric instruction will be useful. And the aim really is to improve the correct production of the target sound, or um, we're all really familiar with that. So a phonological approach um, targets a, a group of sounds with similar error patterns or similar phonological processes. Phonological appro approaches are often selected in an effort to help the child internalize the phonological rules and generalize these rules to other sounds within the pattern, for example, final consonant deletion or cluster reduction. So it's not a sound-by-sound -sound strategy. Um, the 